Hello, my name is Ryan Weber, and today on Build It, we are going to build a line segment worm. What is a line segment worm? Well, it's a series of line segments connected to create a worm-like structure that you can control and and uh, animate by giving it position coordinates. Something like what you see on my screen now. Uh, here I have an X and Y coordinate, uh, one being a a triangular wave and another being a sine wave creating this sort of rainbow heartbeat sort of thing. So we're going to do something much like that. Let's get started. To begin with, what we need to do is we need to build up a data structure of XY coordinates that we can map out to these line segments. To do that, we're going to uh, we're going to use a series of value delay line actors. Uh, the value delay line actor is very helpful in, in uh, segmenting an incoming stream of data. So let's get to that. I'm going to add an absolute value actor just as kind of a placeholder for now as my incoming value point. And a value delay line actor. Uh, the default setting of one is correct because what we want is we want a value to come in and we don't want it to go out immediately. We want that first value to go out when the second value comes in. So there's uh, an offset of one between the incoming and the outgoing value. Uh, to show that kind of a little bit here, what we'll do is add a wave generator that creates some sort of value. Slowly is feeding that through, and we're going to feed that to here. And <clears throat> so we will create a whole series of these. And I want, I happen to know that I want eight values total. So here's eight of these uh, value delay line actors, but I don't need eight. I actually need seven because I'm going to use the initial value as well. So we'll just daisy chain all these together. That way the, the, the data that's being delayed by one value is being passed on to another delay and then on to another delay and on to another delay. And what we end up with is a chain of values that all came in in sequence. Uh, so if I pause this, we can look at uh, the values that are coming through here. Now they're moving pretty quickly, but you can see that we got 58.4, 58.3, 58.31, 58.2, 58.1, 50. So they are in series and they're moving, uh, they're back to back values coming through, but they're going to be sequential. So that's, that's the important part of this. Now I'll unpause that so our values are still rolling. <clears throat> What we want to do with these values is we want to uh, pack them up into a, uh, a grouped chunk of data. We're going to make a piece of uh, JSON, so JavaScript JSON data. <clears throat> it's kind of like an array. And to do that, we're going to use a little piece of JavaScript. Uh, Isadora has a native actor for this coming up, but it's not yet available in uh, public. So I'll use uh, a method that I've written a tutorial on the website for. Uh, it's super easy, very, very few lines of code involved here at all. And I'm just cutting this code from another window I have open as a reference. So again, we'll show you that in a second. We open our JavaScript uh, editor. This is the default code that you see. I'm just going to delete it entirely and add the code that we need. So it's really only the single line of code that takes all the arguments here, all the incoming arguments, and uh, can stringifies them, which is uh, turning them into a text value, which is formatted as this data array for JSON. So it's a JSON stringify arguments command. Uh, we want the number of inputs to be eight, and because there we go, that's what I wanted, uh, because. I'm going to use the default value here. The first value is going to be the live one. Now I will uh, connect our value delays in so that we get 
um, a series of values coming into the JavaScript actor. All right, so what you see on the output of the, um, the JavaScript actor is basically a, a piece of text, I suppose, that uh, is defining that what it's seeing is not a number or not a value that it knows how to translate automatically. Uh, and that's because we're stringifying this, we're turning these values into a big long string. And uh, because this is a green output, we actually need to mutate it into text. Uh, so I will put a trigger text value actor. It's just what I kind of go to for doing this job. And that suddenly mutates and you can see that now we have this uh, string and it's going to be a long string because there's a lot of decimal points in these numbers. But it's a string. If I pause this, you can see it's formatted with a little um, bit of a curly bracket. Then each each value is given a name. So the names are default names. So the first name is 0. The second name is 1. Third name is 2. And the value follows the naming convention separated by commas. So that's what our text looks like. And that's uh, a very standard object format uh, JSON. So let that keep running. And we don't need, uh, well, I'll get that out of the way in a moment, I guess. Uh, the next thing I want to do is add a really small little piece of uh, calculation code to this, which is going to allow us to visually see how much of a spacing we have between our values. So we have a value number one is is a straight shot of what's coming in from our wave generator at this point. And value number two will be after a single delay line. Right. So if I add a calculator actor and I sub uh, I set it to be subtract and I subtract the incoming from one delay line, right? But you can see is the, the first value is always going to be ahead of the second value. And at times we get a negative value because it's moving in the other direction, right? And in this case, I don't want a negative value. So I'm going to add an absolute value actor, which will just simply convert and get rid of that negative for us. Uh, and now we will always have a, uh, a positive value that is telling us what the spacing, the numeric spacing between our uh, our values are. So uh, in this case, between our first and second value. All right. So I'm going to give myself a little more space here. Uh, do that. All right. That looks good. I don't actually need this over here either. But let's move that down. What I want to do is uh, now just grab this, all of it, because it's pretty good. Add a user actor, paste that back inside here. User output, and our user output is going to be that string coming from here. We're going to double click that, label as JSON, and another user actor, our user output, sorry. This is going to be our, uh, what am I going to call that? Sure, call it a value spread. Value spread. And um, yeah, that works for me. We no longer need this because it's now attached to this output. So it's not going to mutate again on us. Uh, I don't want this wave generator. What I want is uh, user input because I want to control that externally and we'll just connect that through there. I want to change that in here. I'll change it to a float with a 0 to 100 range and okay that looks like it should be complete. Save and update that. All right we'll call this, uh, rename this. This is our 8 value delay line and we now have a user actor and you can see this actually this might be a good way to do it is right now uh, all values are zero 
or most of the values are zero there. So if I type in one, and I type in two, and I type in three, and I type in four, you can see now we've got four, three, two, one. They're, they're, these values are being pushed back through the data array. Um, and you can now see that we now have a uh, piece of JSON code, or JSON formatted uh, data, that has a value uh, in the different slots from 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, so value 0 is 8, value uh, 5 happens to be 3, uh, value 7 happens to be 1. So just to give you an idea how the the addressing is done there, it's by the uh, the the number that is in quotations is actually the name of that object, and the value to the right-hand side of the, of the colon is its value. All right. Just to be clear about that. So <clears throat> what I want to do now is I want to, uh, again, add a wave generator so that we have some form of input data. And um, there's two other things I want to add into here. One of them is so that we can uh, use the random setting of the wave generator in kind of a fun way. So if we set that to 6 hertz, you can see we get six different values per, per second, uh, and they jump around a lot. But if we add a smoother actor after this and set it somewhere to like, I don't know, a uh, reasonable number might be 0.6. And I like to run that at 60 hertz because I'm running my frame rate at 60. If I run my input to here, uh, the output is now, instead of being choppy like this is, uh, let's just slow that down. You'll, you'll see that this value keeps changing. So it's smooth, it fills in the gap between, and there's still a bit of a pause there, but maybe at three, you'll see that it's fairly continuous. So it's an ongoing value, it never stops. The next thing I wanna do is add a multi-blocker. Now, we'll set its default to zero so that it's really not blocking anything for the time being. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to be able to show in this value spread that we've built into here that is just showing the difference between our value one input and our value two input. Uh, I want to define this to have a range. And I'm going to say it's from zero to, let's say, 10 because we're probably not going to have much more split than a 0 to 10 split between any value. Although that, that may not be true if we're doing random or something like this. But in this case, we want to see how close they are. And I know for the most most times, they're going to be a smaller value. I'm going to turn that into a, a graphic display. And you can see the, the values popping up. Because we are running uh, random numbers, it's getting kind of big at times. So if I drop this to, uh, I don't know, 0.5, turn this back into some sort of wave, Right, so you can see as a triangle wave, uh, the value spread that we have between our uh, value one and value two, which I guess is object zero and object one, if we're using the JSON naming, uh, remains fairly consistent, and it's sitting at a certain lower value there. Uh, we can see that value um, if we just connect it up here. So you can see it's sitting at somewhere around one and a half. Uh, I like the, the graphic display method of seeing this stuff, though, when I'm trying to visualize things. So um, just so that you know you can do that to pretty much any any input or output in Isadora as long as uh, it has a defined uh, limit range. So it needs a numerical limit range. It can't be min-max. Min-max doesn't know how to scale uh, into a graphic in this way. Right. Okay. So what I want to do now is show you how we can use the multi-blocker as a, as a control on sampling. So we have this stream of data coming in from the wave generator. We're smoothing it, but at this point in time, that's really not really very important because we have smooth data coming from a wave generator. And uh, we're then running that into our value delay, and we're getting very, very close values. Uh, but what I can do is I can spread that out. I can start slowing down how quickly the samples are taken. And as we increase our multi-blocker just even a little bit, um, you can see now that 
our graphic display is sitting some more in the middle of our range of 10 and we're sitting with a, an average distance between our values of like 4.7 or 4.8. And what that will do, uh, because we are eventually going to be mapping these data points out to the XY coordinates of a line or a series of lines that are connected, uh, that is going to change the length of each line. So by increasing the timing on the multi-blocker, we are decreasing our sampling rate, which increases the length of each line segment. So when we have um, the multi-blocker at zero, the segments are really, really close together. Everything is really tight and it's high fidelity. We can, we can get smoother curves and things like that, but our, our line segments are going to be shorter. And we're only going to be working with eight line segments for this particular patch that we're building today. So if they're very, very short, we're not going to have much of a line, but we might have some fairly smooth curvature. And you'll see that in the end, what we end up with here is a, a tool that we can create input. We can change inputs and outputs on, or we can, we can uh, adjust the inputs on a whole bunch of different segments of this and create almost a drawing tool. Okay. Uh, that's that's good. We have a great starting point here. So what we want to do next is uh, create a series of uh, a series of inputs for the lines actor. So let's look at the lines actor first. Uh, we want to draw lines, and uh, here I'm going to rename this one just to be clear. Uh, this is going to be our X. So that means these are our horizontal values. And just so that you understand what I'm doing, I'm going to duplicate that. And to make it clear, we're not going to do anything with this quite yet. But this will be our Y segment, so our, our vertical uh, values. Right? And this way we can, we can change the drawing of both of these things. You know, I can change the waveform on this. So now our vertical is drawing differently than our horizontal. And that's this is the essence of what we're going to do for this drawing tool. All right, so back to our line actor here. And if you look at the line actor, we have a start horizontal position, a start vertical position, an end horizontal position, and an end vertical position. And, and then some drawing attributes like line width and line color, the type of cap. I happen to know that I want the round cap, so I'll do that right now because uh, we'll duplicate this in a minute. And what we want to do is we want to take the first number from this uh, value delay actor and put it in as our starting horizontal point. And then we want to take the second value from this actor and put it in as our end horizontal point. Right? So we're going to create a chain using these values. But we need to, we need to get the values now out of this long string. Uh, so, We've abstracted this a little bit by putting it in the JSON, and in some ways it's complicated things a little bit in the short term, but in the long term it's going to make things a lot easier as we make the entire patch more complicated. And I'll show you more examples of that and explain how that is actually a really powerful thing in allowing you to create more complex generative sort of tools. So there's a new... Um, there's a new actor available from the plugin section of the Isadora of the Trocatronics website called JSON Parser. It's still in beta, but it works great from my experience. And uh, it's like this. So we have a couple options of what we can do with this. Um, <clears throat> number one thing we want to do, though, is, is run our JSON string into it. And you can see right away it says there's eight elements. There's no errors, so our JSON is correctly formatted. And um, if I go quotation, zero quotation, which is the name of our first line, you can, our first data point in our um, JSON, you can see that that value, and if I pause this now, 21.59, 21.59 matches up. So we're getting that data point from our JSON now. And we can continue to do, we can go, let's give us eight of these which is exactly, exactly what we're going to do. Uh, we can now get a nice, if we type in all these data names, which are pretty straightforward. Uh, 
there's all our data points. I will unpause, and now we have... Oh, I see what I did wrong. I was wondering why I wasn't getting my last data point. I put the wrong type of quotation in. There we go. <clears throat> so we have... These are all our data points. Everything looks pretty good. And um, so let's maybe connect one of these up. Well, we can't. Right now, the way that this works is it's splitting up the JSON and it's creating um, a value output. But that value output is actually still a text value. It looks like a number, but it's text. And these outputs are not, at this point, mutatable. And the inputs do not mutate. So there's no way for it to automatically convert that. Uh, so we're going to have to do a conversion on all of these. But luckily, well, I'll say luckily, there's another step we want to do anyway, because I want uh, to have control over the scaling of this input value. And right now, if you look at the, the horizontal input, it's set to a value of negative 200 to 200. And with the Isidora screen having, um, uh, the Isidora stage having a, a range, a visible range of negative 50 to positive 50, up and down and left and right. Uh, these ranges are going to be way out of, way off stage. Uh, but I don't want to limit where we can draw. In that sense, I don't want to be hard code limited in that section of the actor, so that I can't easily change or manipulate that later uh, in an interactive way. So to allow us to have that scaling interactively in the future, what I'm going to do is simply add a limit scale value actor to every one of these actors, or every one of these outputs. Um, but we're going to do that in a more condensed way by using a user actor. We're going to add that limit scale value actor there. A user input for our input value. User output for our scaled value. Two more user inputs so that we can uh, define our input range so that we know <coughs> we know the input that we're getting is 0 to 100. We only want to set our output range because we're scaling it for the line actors. But I'm going to add something as well in line here to do the conversion for us from the text to uh, a number and something I use quite often for this is just a JavaScript actor because the inputs and outputs are very mute, uh, mutable. They'll convert type and JavaScript itself is actually pretty happy to do the type conversion. And the only thing you need to do to, uh, to change the, uh, the, the default code to being perfect for this purpose is remove the plus one. So we're just taking the first argument and sending it back out not manipulating it in any way. So we'll take our input, run it like that. And now we can we can um, we can actually take this, change it to a string, which is our text input, connect that up to here. And now if we enter 20, let's say, it takes a 20 as text, outputs it as a number, it's doing that conversion for us and where we are set, which is fantastic. I want a range of negative 50 to 50 because I just want to keep it on the stage for now. And I will input a value. You'll see we get an output value and we can run that over to our uh, position. So that, we'll rename this actor. We're going to call that uh, text to num scaled just to be clear and we're going to need eight of these so duplicate it duplicate it and I'll bump those up just a little take them and duplicate it one more time perfect well you will connect up all our values Take about a second. Now, this might look like it's a bit of duplication of the work, right? Because we inside this user actor, we bundled everything up, and now we're 
right away we're tearing it apart again. So why didn't we just have like these eight outputs on that one user actor? And you know what? Absolutely, we could have done that. But doing it this way is going to make it so that we can encapsulate the drawing of the lines later into a user actor that uh, we simply just pass one input into. And we could have multiple instances of it. And we only need to pass one value into it every time instead of eight to connect them up. So when we start having multiples of these user actors, passing one parameter to it is a lot easier than passing eight. And imagine if, if, if we created a, a line segment or like a line worm, as we're calling it, instead of with eight segments, but with like 32 segments, and you had to connect up 32 values to every one of them, but you wanted to have, I don't know, five of these going on your patch at once, um, that's going to get really messy. And there's a lot of line segments where it could have just been, you know, if you're running eight of them, eight inputs that you connect instead of eight by 32, which is a lot. Now that that's clear, uh, I'm going to take this and just get it out of my way for now because we want a little space. And uh, the other thing I want to do is I want to get the stage size. Great. And I want to go and make a, uh, a background color. I'm going to make that background color transparent so it doesn't draw anything. But what we will do is... Yeah, I have a 4K screen connected to this, so those that's why my values are like that, but I'm not actually going to be uh, drawing to that because I'm just using the uh, preview for this recording. Uh, not that it matters too much, just so you're aware that that's how my setup is currently, is that my secondary screen is a 4K, whereas I'm recording on a built-in HD screen on the laptop. All right, so... <clears throat> I'm going to feed that uh, that 4K canvas into the lines actor uh, so that it is set up for my uh, stage output correctly. And you know what? Actually, just to even make this more clear, rather than trying to explain the 4K thing in that, I'm going to open the uh, this. I'm going to select a, uh, a different display so it defaults to uh, 1920. And you'll see now we got a 1920 uh, canvas being set up. Great. We are going to duplicate the line actor a number of times. And you know I don't remember exactly how many times it is to make this work. We have eight data values, but how does that work? Well, we daisy chain all these anyway. We daisy chain them. One feeds into the other, so basically we're going to draw one line, and then we're going to pass that image to the next line and draw another line on top of it. And we just keep drawing a line on top until we're ready to output the, the final uh, thing to a projector, which we will do here. And hopefully I got the right number there. Won't matter too much. So our first starting point value, we're only working with the horizontals right now, uh, it goes here, and it doesn't need to go anywhere else. The next value will end up being our end horizontal value for that, but because we're connecting the line to the same point, it becomes our start start horizontal point there. Again, the next one is our end horizontal point and our start horizontal point. See a pattern happening here. End horizontal point. Start horizontal point. All right. End horizontal point. And start horizontal point. And end. And start. And end. And oops. And start and our final one is our end horizontal point I guess we got seven line segments with eight data points and we will just simply remove that it connects that up for us and that is beautiful okay uh, there's one other thing that needs to be done with line drawing actors uh, they don't draw anything unless you trigger them we need to be triggering this at the at our refresh rate essentially 
So how are we going to do that? Well, one simple way is I can just take the data that's coming in and go trigger. So now, now we have, I don't know if you can see that, probably can't, uh, that we have one line being drawn. It's just in a single point. It doesn't have a vertical point set or anything, so it's not really, <laughs> it's not really being drawn very well. But it, that line actor is now activating with every, every data point that comes in and drawing itself. Uh, we need all the other ones to do that too. And the easiest way I think to do that at the frame rate is to take the frame that is being pushed out and have that trigger the next one. So I daisy chain the uh, video outputs to the trigger inputs as a way to cascade um, this along. I missed one there. And um, it works quite, quite well. So what we see now is we have a pretty efficient little thing pumping out all the values for our horizontal and we don't want this one anymore because we all we did all this work over here already we just want to copy this entire thing duplicate that move it down here that gives us a, a separate I'm gonna shrink that down so it's not in our way because we have a little bit of patching to do here uh, and now what we're doing is our first value of this segment is going to be a start vertical point. And then our end vertical point. And you can probably see the pattern is going to continue. Each one of these being an end and a start point of uh, the actors, of the line actors. So this will just take a moment to get connected up. Oop, I'm jumping ahead of myself there. So that was an end point. This needs to be a start point. This needs to be an end point. And a start point. End point. Start point. End point. Start point. And our final end point. Okay, now we are setting a bunch of values. Let's just change this one a little. Let's make that you know, just so the data is different than the other one there, uh, like that. And so I'm going to split this so we can see. And right now we have a, uh, a white line built up of a number of segments bouncing around according to these uh, different waves. So this triangle wave and this uh, sine wave are creating this um, this drawing and you can see that uh, the horizontal is the triangle wave so the bounce back on the left and right sides is far more angular it's the triangle whereas the top and bottom are very curved because they're they're being done through the sine wave just uh, you know and you can play around with this you can Okay, now we've got a sawtooth, so of course it's going to cut back and forth, and that's, you know, sort of interesting. You can go here, you can, like I said, we set it up so we can do random. We can now bump up random, so have it jump around real fast on the uh, the horizontal, but have the vertical still uh, a nice sine wave. And, I mean, there's a bunch of things we can do here. This is part of your drawing tool now, so if we set up, I don't know, two sine waves maybe and uh, make it, I don't know, 25, so they're different. That should get us something like a figure eight. Yeah, there we go, we got a figure eight. All right, so our line segments are pretty small though, and uh, so let's look at this multi-blocker. If we increase that even just a little bit, on you know, ideally on both of them, our line is gonna get longer. It's gonna get flatter in places because the line segments are longer, but you can see we are we are getting a longer line now. And, and we can you know play with that even more. Increase those lines. There's there's a balance between uh, the data coming in and how we're drawing. Right? They're getting longer as we increase these. And if we bring that back down to zero, 
uh, we're going to have a very short line with higher definition. I personally I think I'm going to stick at about 0 0.2, 0 0.02, maybe 0 0.03, just so that we get more of a line. <clears throat> and we'll work with that for now. Okay, so we're doing quite well. We already have, um, we already have our uh, line segment worm drawing essentially, right? Uh, but at this point, it's a pretty messy patch, and you know there's a lot of crisscross and things happening here, and um, sort of messy. What I want to do is I want to start to encapsulate this already. I'm going to uh, select all of our drawing function, uh, and I'm going to include this piece. And I'm just going to cut that. I'm shrink that down. I'm going to add a user actor. And I'm going to paste this in. I'm going to go add a user input. and another user input and I will rename this I'm going to call uh, that's our X so I'll make it X JSON in and make this one um, Y JSON in good enough and we need an output for our video user output Don't. this is our video output All right I'll just save and update that. I'm going to save my file even. So now, um, let's just connect that up. Boom. And uh, let's get it drawing again. Oh, something's not working. Why is that? What did I? What did I miss? Clearly, I missed something. Oh yeah, we're not we're not pounding our uh, initial trigger anymore, so nothing is coming through. <coughs> it's easy enough. I'll take that Im same input that I had before, actually, and uh, just run it. So our our live input, I'm just going to skip over top of everything else and just take it as it bumps in. Update that. Update that, and you see that we have uh, the same drawing happening now with a single user actor doing it and uh, zoom back to normal zoom rename this we're going to rename now I'm going to call it uh, what was it this, I guess it's uh, seven seven segment um, line worm that's what I'll call it so there's our seven segment line worm but if we wanted to have two of those uh, going just for fun, we will do that because we will show you what other fun things we can do here. So uh, we're now drawing them right on top of each other. So I guess I'll move one over just with the projector for now. And uh, you can see that, you know, sort of interesting, right? Uh, and that's using the same data for for both. Now, what we could easily do is, um, you know, draw two different two different uh, segments of this line. So, duplicate our values, change them up a little. Yeah, something like that, sure. Make it a, ma a faster moving one. Feed these uh, pieces of data into this other line. And now we have, you know, another line that's moving a lot quicker. Yeah, so two line segment things going on really, really quickly now. It's powerful to be able to create these uh, user actors that only need this XY input uh, and we could have even bundled that. It could be a single input rather than two inputs. Uh, you really have a lot of choice here in what you do with your JSON, but 
right now it was easy enough just to create our, our two arrays and those connections are good for me at the moment. Okay, so next steps, let's, uh, let's do some, let's, uh, let's add a little color to this thing and, uh, and go into these actors and uh, how do we want to do this? I will take, um, I'm going to kind of create a rainbow of color based on uh, one of these ranges of values. So I think what I'll do is I will take uh, this, which is the horizontal value, and uh, add a limit scale value factor that takes one of these values, which at this point is still 0 to 100. So it takes a value of 0 to 100 and maps that to... Uh, let's see, um, 0 to 360. That's our full range of color. And if we uh, do a color, color maker, hue, saturation, brightness, we can take that piece of it into the hue. And so what we're going to do is we're going to juggle this around real quick. And um, you know what I might even do? I'm going to take this, I'm going to put it inside here. We're going to get our color through our scaling range so that um, we, right after it's converted to a number format, we just take that user output. We're going to output a color. And uh, now our user actor has a color output. Bang. And you can see that this color kind of morphs through its position. So that's cool. And we should have one of these for every one of these, I would think. I don't, there might be one too many or something like that. Yeah, we got one more than we need, but it's fine. So now every line that's being drawn has a color that is defined uh, by its positioning, one part of its position. So, um, yeah, okay, let's see how that looks. We'll update all, save update all, bang, look at our view again. And now we have two rainbow colored lines being drawn all around, all right? All right, well, what else can we do to these line segments? I mean, it seems pretty obvious to me that we'd be, it would be nice to be able to interactively change the, um, the thickness of these lines. Now, we could, we could do something where we look at this value and um, determine, uh, you know, scale it to a range of sizes and then have the size of that segment. Yeah, sure, let's do it because it's fun. Let's do it. Um, and that way we'll have it dynamically being set and every segment will change size on its own uh, depending on where it is horizontally, I suppose, in this case. <clears throat> so we'll take an input and we want to scale that to, I don't know, 0.5 to uh, 3. I know that, that those happen to be fairly reasonable line sizes. These are output. Connect that across. Line size. Save update all, and um, yeah, so we got these line sizes that now can go, can connect up to the line size. Um, and see this, the stuff. It's great to break it into user actors because uh, at, a, at a certain point you're you're really connecting up a lot of different things and it can get a little messy, um, particularly when, it, when I'm just doing loads and loads of straight lines like this. I, I could be segmenting this, but it's, it would take me a lot longer to, to do it all. Um, this one I missed here. 
I knew something that was out of sequence. And so then this one to here. So everyone matches up and we now have uh, a line that uh, gets skinny to the left and fat to the right. That's, that's how it's working. Um, and I mean, you can do whatever you want with this stuff, obviously. But we'll update both and that'll make both of these lines do that. Uh, so you could put, you could more, more switches on there. You could maybe define something so that it modifies that or, you know, change up its behavior in one way or another. Uh, it doesn't really matter much. So we've got these uh, things drawing. We'll now center that again so that everything's within the palette. Now I'm going to video mix these. Actually, not. you know what? I'm not even going to. I'm going to... Um, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. We're almost done here. So we're going to take dots. I'm just going to do some like fun stuff. I uh, often like doing this. I don't know why, but I find the effect is <laughs> quite pretty. Uh, I like to draw dots over top of my line and maybe make my line less intense. Yeah, so you can see I've got some dots that are now drawing over that. And uh, here I could, I don't know, let's uh, make that more subtle. And I, I don't know, I think I have a free frame effect that, oh yeah, I got free frame tile in here. So I'm just gonna tile that bang to give me a like a drawing sort of background. Uh, yeah, so there we go. That's that's all I'm going to do for now. And uh, that shows you how you can create a, a line segment worm. Uh, kind of control it interactively uh, through those wave generators. I mean, anything coming into that, you could have XY position of a mouse. So you could be draw following a mouse. You can... Um, <clears throat> You can do a number of really kind of fun things this way. So here's a line segment worm, and uh, just just for just for fun, I'm going to uh, kick one of these into random because I kind of like the random thing. When I bump that up to 20, you can see I got this jiggity jaggedy sort of thing going on here, and uh, that to me is kind of fun. Uh, I might do the same here to make some squiggles. If I make some squiggles uh, on the background one, so now our backgrounds are just squiggle backgrounds, and then we can make the the front a more, you know, shapely sort of front piece. And um, yeah, put it into a sort of a circular motion. I don't know. You can you can phase offset these things. You could make a control panel to give you a whole bunch of controls and, you know, have drawing capabilities of some sort. Uh, yeah, so lots of fun. Lots and lots of fun. I like that. It's, uh, it's always a good time. <laughs> and uh, the one last thing I wanted to briefly mention is that these value delay lines and the way that we're working with this... Uh, works you know really nicely for creating a line that one line is connected to the next line is connected to the next next line type of thing uh, in a series like this but what we we could easily be um, doing the same sort of thing with these values and instead of a line actor we could be doing particles right we could have numerous particle actors here and we could be instead of XY we could have XYZ and we could be drawing particles into space and have a have a series of I don't know. Let's say we drew a particle that looked like an asteroid. We could have a series of asteroids draw, drawn in a line through 3D space and have them all drifting towards us and different things like that. The really the um, the possibilities are endless. And when you start to move it into some of these other actors, I didn't use a particle actor because it's massive. It has so many inputs, I wouldn't be able to get this tutorial finished in a timely manner. But I wanted to be mention that you have that possibility to, to, to take this way of taking these these the series of data in a data array and and draw that out using other actors and create some really beautiful effects. You're not limited to little line segments with color, you know, blo uh, like rainbow colors. You can uh, you can really take this a lot further. That said, what I want to show 
is that um, you know I've done the same thing a couple times already, and over here just by adding some uh, feedback effects <clears throat> to something very much like what we just built, I created this really kind of crazy looking spiral psychedelic sort of segmented thing, and it is really uh, if you look at it. Uh, where is the main part of it? Here it is. It's essentially the same thing. I have two, two line segment actors being fed by XY coordinates. Um, and they just happen to have more video effects. I got some dots, some feedback loops with a spinner. And I'm using a, um, uh, what do you call it? Stage, stage background actor here to uh, really ramp up some uh, built-in feedback loops. Anyway, so that's a quick and easy sort of beautiful thing. Ooh, I don't know. Let's uh, let's just have one more moment of fun here. Because it's so quick and easy now to add to this, right? We just take this, we duplicate it, and we have another line being drawn. We, uh, we just, so fast. It's, it's amazing. So we have, uh, we'll take out the tile, because this one I don't want a tile. And uh, we will, um, I don't know, um, I will make this like that. Oh yeah, I don't even think I've tried this before. And we'll phase offset this 50. And let's make that one six and make this one, I don't know, um, uh, three. Haven't tried this before. So now we've got this, I don't even know what shape that is. Uh, it's weird is what it is, I don't know. Uh, 15, let's see, and then get that jumping around a little bit weirder. Uh, 4.7, sure. Uh, so now you can see we've got another line doing some crazy background stuff there. Um, and I'll make it a little brighter. So, you know, that's our new line being drawn. So now we've got three line segment things being drawn all over the place. We're running at 60 frames per second. And uh, and the load is low. Uh, Isidore can handle loads and loads of these these uh, GPU-based lines. So you can really kind of go go crazy and draw lots of stuff and have a great time. All right, that's it. Absolutely, we're done. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I hope you got something out of building this line segment worm and looking at how to use some JSON and uh, strings of data values. All right, signing off. Have a great day.